Um, so we're going to talk about actual prediction thread. Um, uh, so a couple things. Um, checkpoint one due April 6th. Um, however, uh, Piazza Post may have indicated that there might be a problem with project two. And so because it's kind of leaving the game, we'll see what we can do about setting that first checkpoint. Um, yeah. Oh, did I copy the paper on? Yes, but uh, yeah, sorry, the, the slide is still wrong. Um, my bad, it's the Friday. Um, I'm one of those people that can't look at a date. I don't get any of the day of the week. So it's supposed to be, supposed to be next Friday, right? Or is it next Friday? Yeah. This Friday. Uh, so we'll see about extending it if there really is a problem with it. Um, however, I suspect, given the missing first cell, uh, that there is actually a problem. Um, However, it shouldn't actually affect your work. It just affects whether the grade is that strong. Yes. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you have confidence, you want to try it with grade scope. And keep in mind, checkpoint one is, and checkpoint two, that matter, is really a pass fail. It's not the quality of your work is not being evaluated per se. It's just whether you've made an attempt at every question uh, up until the checkpoint. Does that make sense? Okay. Right. So the accuracy of them is not necessarily a question. All right, another thing you said, um, as hopefully you're all familiar with, uh, there are course assistance for this class. Um, if you would like to potentially be one in the fall, uh, you can apply here. This is the same form that if you want to do, if you're taking any other data science classes, uh, if you want to apply to be a course assistant for any of those, it's all the same form. So you can either scan the QR code or wait for the slides to go up and log away. Or if you really want to, you can type that thing in. All right, any questions? So, going about the midterm, uh, actually, to talk about midterm a little more. Uh, I've created an opportunity for uh, you to be able to recover some of your points if you uh, didn't do the lot of you would like on midterm. Uh, the announcement for that and what you have to do will be during discussion on Friday. Okay, so if you're not going to be in the session Friday, then I do recognize it is a uh, religious holiday on the Sunday. Um, you know, let us know via private piazza post, and we will, depending on who it is, and, or not who, but like uh, how many it is, we'll come up with a way to be remote and still ask you. Yeah. Uh, was there an average immediate post? <laughs> there was not. Um, the average was about uh, like a B minus C plus. Um, so I was not thrilled with that. I wanted a higher average. Uh, so that's part of why I'm thinking about adding a uh, an opportunity to recover points. Any other questions? Um, I have a different grade on the midterm on Facebook and on Blackboard. Yeah, so uh, it's it's a manual process to save some grades both the Blackboard. So sometimes when the regrades go in or whatever, people just forget to click the button that says repost them. So um, what we'll do, what we'll do is I'll make sure they all are done tonight. Uh, so I think all the regrades are cleared, um, and I'll resync them all. So basically, if by Friday you still think they're out of whack, just uh, let well know in the discussion, um, or do a private piazza post, and we'll fix them one individual one. They do sometimes get misaligned because your grade scope ID and your Blackboard ID for some reason don't match. Uh, so if you're consistently seeing a problem, uh, definitely let us know via private piazza yeah, post uh, because you have to manually go kind of fix the the syncing between your your two accounts. Okay, well, we've definitely had it happen before. Uh, so going back to midterm, we had a number of people who had trouble with probability. Uh, so oh sorry, this is actually with histograms. Also had problems with histograms. Uh, so just going back to that slide. Um, so with a histogram, you can actually measure the histogram and calculate what number of things are in there or the distribution. Like you can kind of get to all these different numbers, right, if you rearrange the various parts. So just keep in mind, the percent in the bin is divided by the width of the bin is equal to the height. Okay, so you can now calculate for, from a histogram, you can calculate the various pieces and which ones you have, right? And you often have the height and the width, right? And so you want to know what the percentage of the bin is, for example. 
Um, so the area of the bar is equal to the percentage in the bin is the height and the width, the time of the width of the bin. Uh, so how many individuals are in the bin? You use the area. So right, the width times height is the how many are there are. Um, and then how crowded is the bin is the height. Okay, so the crowdedness, that's kind of the percentage indicator. So it's a percentage of the overall total is in that particular bin. Right. And visually, you can see it, right? It's whichever one is the tallest. It's got the most percentage, right? The smallest ones have the least. But you can also like look at the actual numbers and it's, it's a real number. It's not, you know, bar graphs, I think, tend to be, um, it's a little harder to tell. Like you can't tell what the percentage is. You can just say there's 20 of them in here based on the height of a bar graph, but you can't say what percentage that 20 is of the total. And with the histogram, we can. All right. So keep those in mind. They will likely be tested again on the final exam. Um, and then probability. Uh, most of you seem to get probability this time. Maybe what I should be putting up here is the order of operations, because the number of people who drop the parentheses on the addition underneath the division uh, was mind blowing. So you must have the parentheses if you want it to happen first, right? So if you say four slash five plus two, it's a very different number than four slash parentheses five plus two parentheses, right? Two very different numbers. You have to get those parentheses in there correctly, otherwise it will be wrong. So this is just how you do the probability, right? The lowest value is zero, highest value is one, um, but we usually write it with the percent symbol, okay? But that indicates that it's actually kind of to the right of the decimal. Um, and then they complemented the inverse. Um, and so all equal, all the outcomes are equally likely. This is how you can calculate it. Um, and so it's just the division, which I think, like I said, both of you got, except for the parentheses. Um, and then this one seemed to also be a little bit of trouble. So basically, it, it, you know, the way, at least the way I remember this, is that multiplication means it's less likely to happen. Okay. So if you have conditions and you need to satisfy multiple, so like you are flipping a coin and you want two tails, okay, that's going to be less likely than if you get a tail and you know and then anything, right? So that's kind of how the multiplication works. Um, and then the addition is kind of like not a great example with heads and tails, but let's use like a die, right? So if you roll a die. And you want a four, right? And then if you roll a second, then die again, and you want, um, you know, whatever a four, it's going to be um, basically it's it's equal to or greater than the original. Uh, I'm trying to get a better example. That one. Um, it, oh, it's it's how it can be satisfied. So let's say um, it can be a one or a two, and then it can also be a one or a two. That's going to be greater a chance, right? All right, so, and then, like I said, sometimes it's much easier to figure out the complement than it is to figure out the, the actual question. So in this case, um, you want any outcome except for uh, all tails. Uh, and so what you actually do is calculate for the tail scenario, right? And then invert it, and now you have the answer for the question, right? All right. So moving on to the major content. Uh, so surprise, um, could you predict that I was going to talk about this? So this, we've talked about this already. This is the nearest neighbor mechanism, right? So we kind of throw them all on a scatter plot and can we predict the child height and the mid parent height? Um, and so what we do is we look nearby, right? Uh, to the, the data elements we have, and then we can make a prediction by simply using the averages within a window. All right, and so this is just the same thing, except it actually calculated all those averages so that you can now get a prediction for each of those child heights. Um, and so great, like that's that's one way to do it. It's got some problems, right? Because you have like the range around the dot, right, is pretty big, right? So you so your prediction is probably not that great, right? It's not going to be that close. But it's not terrible either, right? I mean, you know, for like this one, it's between 55 inches and I don't know, 72 inches or something. Um, 
And so it does a pretty good job, but maybe we can do better. Um, and so the reason we start talking about the correlation coefficient is because we're going to use it in order to make better predictions. Okay? Um, as well as it's a, it's a hint as to whether there's something there. Right. And so we talked about this last time, um, basically a range between negative one and one. If it's one, then it's like totally up, you know, up and to the right. Um, and if it's negative one, it's down. And if it's zero, there isn't really a relationship. So if you look at the scatter, um, you can kind of see it here. This one is, it doesn't have a great uh, correlation, but you can kind of see it is kind of going up and to the right, right? As basically as parents get taller, their kids tend to get taller. So there's probably a positive correlation there. All right, so at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is predict Y using X, right? So we want, so we have this piece of data, and we're trying to predict this piece of data, okay? And based on what we said last time, right, you can also, you can kind of invert the graph, uh, you know, if you have your Y, right? To, Invert it, and it's the same. It's the same question, right? All right. So, for example, and these are some real ones that have happened. Is you know predicting the number of hospital beds available using air pollution. So, if you look at um, the current air pollution, you can actually make a reasonable guess as to how many free beds in the hospital there will be, because when there's high air pollution, people then go to the hospital, which takes up beds. For example. Uh, or predict house pricing using the house size. Uh, this one I think is particularly interesting because this is very region specific, right? Um, a house price in inner city Boston that's a thousand square feet uh, is probably going to cost the same thing as somewhere out in Springfield for a thousand square feet. Uh, or sorry, for like you know five thousand square feet. Right? They, so it is going to be region dependent. But if you have the right region, you can do a pretty good job of this. That'd be probably the guess. And then app users using number of app downloads. Obviously, there's a lot of apps people download, but then uh, they don't use. So some percentage of the downloads is going to be the number of users you have. But you can make some predictions there because it's probably pretty consistent. All right. So nearest neighbor regression. Um, so basically, this is kind of what we've been talking about is where we have an X value and the prediction is the average of the Y values in its nearby group. And so far, what we are doing for the nearby group is just kind of two straight lines, right? Uh, and that's how we got our nearby group. And we graph these uh, predictions as the graph of averages. The association between X and Y is linear, then puts the graph of averages, averages tends to fall on the line. That's a long way of saying what I think we're going to show a picture of in a minute. But the long and the short of it is, uh, if we go actually we go back to the other picture, I thought there was a picture sooner. Um, but as you can kind of see, right, these this prediction here is starting to make what looks like a line. So rather than there's so different ways we can do this, right? So in this model, we had to go and take 66, right? Then find the region around it, then average the region. Wouldn't it be easier if we could just create a line? It goes there, then we can just look up 68 on the line and we know what the value is. We don't have to calculate all those averages. That makes sense? Right? Once we know what the line looks like, we can now put the line there and just we know what it is all the time without having to actually calculate the averages or having nearby data. All right. So the slope of the line, um, as you may or may not recall from lower school. Uh, slope times the x plus the intercept, and so therefore, and why do we put it this way? Because we want the y, right? So now the question is, right, we have x and y, but where are we going to be sloping the intercepts? All right, well, the intercept of the regression line, so, oh, sorry, I didn't explain. So the intercept is where it crosses the x-axis, right? So that's, let me just... In case you haven't seen this before, where's the where's the line? Yeah. All right. So imagine this yellow thing being a line, right? And when this line continues on, when it crosses, that's going to be the intercept. So at what point, what x does it cross? 
and the slope is the angle, right? So we can, because with those two pieces of data, we can actually draw any line. All right. So if we have the, if we want to get to the intercept, we know that the average of y minus the slope times the average of x will give us the intercept. And then the slope of the regression line, the slope of the line, is the standard deviation of y and the standard deviation of x. I'm sorry, the standard deviation of y divided by the standard deviation of x multiplied by r. Again, parentheses are required. Actually, I think you get lucky on this one. All right, and so we end up with slope times x plus the intercepts. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so now we have kind of all the pieces we need because we know how to get the standard deviation, we know how to do the average, we have the x and the y, and so we need to do this one first, right? Because we need it up there. So we plot the slope in there once we do this calculation. Then we can calculate that and we get the intercept. Now we take that slope that we had from before, multiply it by x plus the intercept, and we get um, the estimate of y. All right, and so we generally want to do this in standard units uh, so that it's understandable. Um, because if you notice on my prior slide with the heights, right, that intercept is going to be, I don't know, it's kind of hard to tell where it was going to be, but let's say it was near 40, right? So we tend to shift the thing into standard units so that the intercept is at zero. All right. Now, yeah. All right, so you may remember this. Um, basically, what this function does, and it's defined above, if you want to look at it, is it creates a table which will result in an R of the value you pass it. That's what this method does, um, so that we can use it for examples. So if we look at the scatter of that, we expect it to be up and to the right. Right, except it's not perfect, that's why it's not a straight line, um, but it's pretty good. Um, and then, kind of the same idea. Oops, I guess that was just a good thing. Um, so, now what we want to do is actually try to do our prediction example. Oh, actually, while I'm looking for the window, uh, the answer to the question on Piazza is 32. And if you hadn't noticed before, it was really bothering me that um, the numbers were out of order, so they are facing. Mm. Okay, so this is now we're going to write a method that uses our old, let's say, technique uh, for doing that prediction, right? With the averages. So in order to do that, we're going to try to get the neighbors. Okay, we're going to call them neighbors. One of the words I cannot ever spell correctly. So we're making it a little bit tighter this time. Oops. Okay, so now we have a little method that will do that nearest neighbor mechanism of prediction. Okay, except our, our input here is just that table we generated based on an R of 0.99, right? So, so one that's going up very fast or going up very tightly, I guess is what we said. All right, so what we want to do is now add to our table 
um, a calculation of each of those predictions. And right, And so now we have our line that we've generated, except it's not really a line, right? It's um, so I don't know if you can tell, but it's actually just a whole bunch of dots, right? Because we haven't actually created a line yet. We just said, okay, so for each individual one, let's go calculate those nearest neighbors and then we'll plot it on the graph. Now you notice, right, it took a minute for one. And that's even for a relatively small bit of data because it has to go pull out that chunk, calculate the average, add it to the table. Um, and so it would be better if we had a more efficient way of, of doing the same thing or something similar at least. All right, so what we can do instead, right, is we can talk about a line. And in this case, what we did was we just drew a line of slope one, okay? And the intercept by default in that draw line is gonna be uh, zero. So we just are drawing a line of slope one. And as you can see, right, it's pretty close because the R, right, was 0 0.99. So a line of slope one is going to be pretty close to the to the correct line. And obviously calculating from that line is a lot cheaper than doing the average of all the examples. So let me let me clarify a little bit. So so it, it's better to like you know take it at face value, right? It's better to have the line to do predictions, but what do we have to do to get the line in the first place? I talked about this a little, I think the last time, maybe the time before. Any ideas? We have to do those calculations on what you call ground truth, on real data. So in other words, our real data in this case is the blue dots. Okay, so this is something we collected. So in the case of the mid-parent with children, it's actually the, the heights of real people and their children. And then we put those all into a table and then we calculate the initial positions so that we can do the standard deviation and all that jazz. We have to have original data in order to create the design design of the line. But then once we have the line, then we can use that for predictions rather than going back to our original data. So, okay, so, so it's not that we don't do the thing in the first place because we still need the data, we still have to go collect it. But now what we can do is create a regression line instead of using this nearest neighbor technique so that we can, it's a cheaper prediction algorithm. All right. So if we instead have our table be um, have a correlation coefficient of zero, right, then there isn't going to be a relationship there. So we just get a blob when we run it as a scatter plot. And you know it can be a little hard, hard to sell from a visual representation, but you know I think you hopefully can see right. This does look different than that mid-parent height child one, which wasn't that strong a relationship. But you can tell that this is not like football shaped, right? It's it's circular. All right. So what happens when we try and do the same thing with this? Wait, wait. Okay. So here's where we start to get a problem, right? Is that our prediction is based on kind of this idea of that line, right? Or that the averages will help. But in fact, it doesn't really seem to help very much because we're we're just kind of in the middle of the block. Okay, so it does matter that we have like a linear relationship between the two. So we have to have a correlation coefficient. This is another reason why we need that number. So we want a correlation coefficient that's useful because if it's you know 0 0.01, we're probably not going to get a very good linear regression. So and so technically, right? Technically, this is correct. Okay, so we drew this linear regression. It's at zero because it was a perfectly not correlated uh, set of data. So we get this line. The thing is, is that it's just it's not a very good prediction 
right? Because there's so much range in how wrong we are. We're going to talk about the error stuff in a bit. All right. Um, so here's a kind of a better example with 0.5, and that looks a lot like our mid pair height. Um, and so then we can start to think about, okay, well, what we want to know is how far away are we from our prediction with the actual ground? Here. So, okay, I should go back to the slide a little bit. Um, So what we can kind of do while withdrawing that black line, right, is we can kind of say, okay, let's look at a particular example and say 1.5 here um, and kind of look at the difference between our predicted line, which is that red line and the yellow dots, okay? And we can kind of see that distance between the two. And so that's how we're gonna look at it because what we did was we essentially just guessed here and said, this red line, we're just gonna give it a slope of one and just, you know, call it a day, right? Um, and hope that it's close to that series of yellow dots, but maybe that's not going to be the most effective way to do it, because you can see right where this black line is, and probably other points as well, our prediction line is getting quite far away from what we calculated to be. So that's why we want to get into using the other, like a, a mathematical technique to actually get to what that line should look like, rather than just kind of guessing. Even though a lot of the time, well, like in the early, like in this one, we we actually can kind of guess, right? Um, I keep forgetting how much of this is actually going to um, So our initial guess was not very good, right? Our slope of one, but then, hey, maybe we do a slope of 0.5, and that's actually getting pretty close. So from kind of eyeballing it, we can actually get some pretty good regression lines. The thing is, there's easier ways to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think I was supposed to show the first part of the Jupyter notebook earlier, and then talk about the regression line. But so now, instead of going back to the slide, what we're actually going to do is okay. Now let's go actually calculate the line itself. How can we figure out what it should be? Well, the thing you know, the thing that we've already used. I want to say it was last lecture. So we have a mechanism for creating standard or for moving something into standard units, and we have a mechanism for creating the correlation. And so, you know, but the one depends on the other. So then we move on to how to calculate the slope. And so to give you a hint, right, we have the mechanism here is the you know the one uh, formula in the bottom left is the slope. On the top is the intercepts, and then ultimately we can get to the estimate for y. So, what do we put in for the slope? Exactly. Any ideas? We can start with the slope. Now, how can we calculate the slope? R times S C Y over S C X. One more time with the water. R times S C Y over ten deviation of X. Right. So our R is actually in correlation, but yes. Um so, so first thing, oh sorry, I shall do this is more forward. R equals correlation. Right. So then we pass kind of all the pieces that we were given. So now we have the R, and then we're going to say, okay, let's get the standard deviation of Y. And so we do that with MP standard or MP standard deviation, I guess. Um, but we want to just pass it the array. Then we're going to do the same thing with the X. And then we do basically just subtract, which is R times uh, the Y over SE. 
divided by x s e. Okay. All right. So now we have to do the same thing with the intersect. Um, so for this, um, we're obviously we're going to call the slope. But what do we need for the rest of it? Get the intercepts. And now we have a function that does the slope. So if we do to create the rest of the calculation, maybe we we want to get the two other parts, right? So how can we get uh, the other parts that we need in that calculation? I'll just do oh, I'll use this for later. Current, then we need something like. All right, so how do I get the mean of X and the mean of Y? I know it's one. Well, how do I get these? Average of all the x's and all the y's. You've done this much. How do we do? Other ideas. All right, so how do I get the mean of x? Would you use like np dot mean? Yes. You should have dot mean on what? Um, or t dot column x. Ah. <laughs> Right, and we do exactly the same thing. We get the mean of y. Oh, wait. I don't know what just happened. Oh, I get that. Right, so that will give us the, um, the mean of x and the mean of y, and then if we subtract the mean of y, subtract the slope, and add the mean of x, we'll get the intercept. So now we have a method that will give us both. Oh, that's all. That's all wrong. Or you go on this one. No, you go on this one. All right, there we go. Okay, so the first example is just getting us the slope. Um, and then we can also just add a cell here. And we can test the intercept as well. Okay, and so at first watch, this also might be a little confusing because the, the name of the column is X, right? But then the name of the variable is also X. So just be note the quotes, right? Well, I should have used single quotes again, but you know, here we use quotes, but up there we don't because what's in the variable X is the letter X, right? Or the string X. So that's why, at least like I said, at first watch, it might be confusing. But so now that gives us the intersect and we give us and it gives us the slope and so now we can construct a line. So if we use that Galton pick data again and we now have you know we just grab those two columns and pair on the table. And so now um, we can now do a predictor. This is using our nearest neighbor, but I was going to show.
when it's doing the predictions, and as you can see, it takes a while. But instead, all right, so instead, if we use the second method, right, we can actually look at taking the slope and the intercept, and we get that those two lines, or we get the two pieces of the line, and here's the heights of that individual record. So, yeah. For the intercept function, you put mean y minus slope plus mean x, but shouldn't it be mean y minus slope times mean x? Yes, it should. I'm sorry. This is why uh, doing demos and lectures is always scary. And why I try to have a good GG. Uh, let's actually make that correct. All right. All right. So, now we kind of have enough information to be able to do the slope and the intercept, and so we can now start to do predictions based on our mechanism. So what we did first was we just did the average nearest neighbor predictions so that we can get an idea of what was our, our first technique for doing the prediction algorithm. We just threw those in the table along with the actual data, um, and now we can do it with the regression prediction, which Make sure I don't kind of type those again this time. Um, so we want to do yeah, so so this is kind of I should I should read the function, but we'll just do it this way because it'll be a little clearer what's going on. Um so heights dot column. Good parent. And then add the intercepts. Okay, so we calculated those before based on our existing data. And then we're going to, oops, I'm going to stop. Nope. All right, and so now we have our nearest neighbor prediction. We have our real data too, right? So we know for this particular set of data, we know what the, the right answer is. We know that if the mid, you know, for this particular set of parents, their child was 65.5 inches. And so we see that the average neighbor prediction is 70.4. Um, and the regression prediction is 182. All right, it must be a back off. Oh, I better we can recalculate the slope after the fixing the code. That was better. Okay, so the regression prediction now, as you can see, you know, it's a much cheaper way of getting to that same ish data. And so we can say, hey, look, they're they're pretty close to that average nearest neighbor. Um, and for all we know, they might actually be slightly better predictions, right? Because maybe it is more consistently linear than the average of the nearest neighbors. So it could even be a better solution, but we definitely know it's a lot cheaper, right? It runs a lot faster. So we have a question? Yeah. So in, in the slope calc, if I had plus and it should have been multiplication. Yeah, here, oh, no, the intercept, sorry. Um, and so I had run, I had this method, right? And then I calculated the intercept here, oops, here, um, and hadn't gone back and rerun it once I had corrected it. So I was using the wrong intercept the first time around when doing the prediction. All right. And now I can actually throw all of that out of the scatter plot. And so again, even though it looks like it might it might look like it's lines, they're not actually, it's actually just doing individual predictions, not drawing the line. So the yellow dots are using the nearest neighbor mechanism, and the blue dots are using the regression or the linear regression prediction. Um, you will commonly hear a linear regression referred to as just a regression. So you kind of keep that in mind. Um, but as you can see, the blue is actually a line. And it's it's pretty close to the yellow one, so it's probably pretty good. And like I said, could even be better, depending on the nature of the data. 
All right. So now what we want to do is figure out what's our, our error, right? And so we show this prior picture in a second. Um, so if you kind of look at, I don't know, I mean, this isn't that helpful, but um, so we call this least squared because you kind of look at the distance, it almost like a square away from the individual item. Um, and so typically some errors are positive and some are negative, and measure the raw side of the errors. We square the errors to eliminate cancellation. Okay, so um, or like I said, like I've talked about before, we'll sometimes use squaring to not only essentially like make an absolute value, but also like enhance the difference. Um, and then we take the mean of those squared errors, and then we take the square root to fix the unit, so to kind of bring it back to where we started. Um, and then we end up with what's called the root mean square error, okay, or the RMSE. And, and typically, we talked about MSE last time or the time before, um, but root mean square error is the one we use most commonly. So, a little demonstration of that. So I'm just probably gonna I think I'm just gonna take this thing because otherwise you know the obvious with photo. Sort of. Okay, so we'll come back to these two methods in a second. Um, but basically, we're going to load another table of data, okay? And this one has the states and then what congressional district they're in, um, and then the median income for a household, the percent voting for Clinton, and the Collins percentage uh, for that congressional district. To see, you know, like how many people graduated from college. All right. And we're just going to pull out the median income and the percent uh, graduated from college and kind of ignore the people who voted for Clinton. And so we're going to throw that into a scatter plot. Okay. And as you can see, we should have a pretty decent R value here, right? Pretty, uh, pretty positive one. Uh, and so that's looking like it's getting towards one, I don't know, maybe 0.7 or something. All right. But then we can actually calculate it. Oh, it was a little off. So 0.8. Okay, we actually calculated the R value for um, this these two data elements. So we can see it's 0.81. So that's a pretty good correlation, pretty good positive correlation. So then we can actually create our uh, slope and intercept. Okay, and that's going to be the slope is oh seven. A little off, but we'll let it be for now until I get further. And then we're going to actually do our prediction by calling this method fitted values. Okay. And fitted values is the one I just kind of scrolled by a little bit quickly, but it, it's kind of like a, another way of saying here, you know, you estimate it using the regression. So, um, you know, you pass in the table, you pass in your X and you pass in your Y, and then it goes and calculates the slope and the intercept. And then it creates a line so they can actually get a whole array back of predictions. Okay. So that's what fitted values does. Uh, we'll keep using this method like a whole bunch of times. So this will be a good one to uh, make sure you understand. Um, and then, so now we have our fitted values. Um, and I'll show it in, yeah, I'll show you what's fitted, why we use the word fitted in it. Um, and so we end up with basically an array of these predicted lines, right? So now we, we fed in the data we had, and we're going to try to make some sort of prediction. And so we're going to create a line so that we can do the predictions along the line based on the individual X inputs. So, oops, what's this selection of bugs? 
All right. So then I end up with a uh, or create a scatter plot with our linear prediction. Okay. And so the reason we call it fitted values, okay, is it because it's like we're trying to fit the line into the data. Okay. So that's what I mean by fitted. So you'll see. So fitted is kind of synonymous with prediction. Um, but it's a very commonly used term to say, hey, I have this like mechanism to fit into the data for doing things like prediction or other stuff. And so that's why that method is called fitted values. But here's our linear prediction. Okay. So, you know, again, this isn't an actual line, it's just the dots by putting in all of our known data, putting in all the college percentages, and then doing a prediction of what the median income would be based on the data that we had originally. So the data we had originally. We went and created a line out of, in that data, and we said, okay, use that to predict the values. And so now we can see that we have, um, like, from eyeballing it, right, we have a pretty decent predictions based on just that line. Okay. So. All right, so how do you imagine that we would get the errors to find out how good is our line or how good are our predictions? Any ideas? And if you notice, we, we have the, the correct answers, right? That's what the blue is in that graph, right? Those are the correct answers. As in, we went out and actually gathered this information and this was the correct answer. So we want to compare the correct answers to our predicted answers. So how would I do that? Very simple. There it is. It has that. We might want to look at the difference between the two. So how would I do that? Subtract them. So we can just say, and we're just going to do this in this direction to kind of set it up correctly. Um, technically, right, if you were just looking at the difference, it, it doesn't matter which one you're subtracting from the other. Um, but we can throw that into our table along with now we have median income, we have college percentage, we have our linear prediction, but remember we're trying to predict median income, and now we have the error from median income and linear prediction. So what we did is we took all of these X values, we created a prediction, and then we subtracted it from the right answer, okay? To try to get a sense of how good is our line, right? And it looks like it's pretty close, right? I mean, the numbers seem biggish, but you know, if you kind of look at the examples, you know, so this is thirteen, uh, fourteen hundred dollars, right? Between you know fifty-one thousand and fifty thousand. So that's actually pretty good, right? And we probably are in general doing a pretty good job. Because I haven't noticed once. All right. So then we might want to look at that average of the errors. Okay. And so um, the average is really pretty close. Because if you notice, right, this is in uh, scientific notation, that's a, that's quite a small number, right? So it's really close to zero. So that our, oh, sorry, I uh, I got ahead of myself. Uh, any ideas why this is really close to zero? So first of all, this is a, an error on the part of Python, because remember that's 13 digits that way of zeros, okay? So that means that Python blew itself up. So just read that number as a zero, right? Actually, I can even do it's just uh, random. And I'll be a little bit clearer, right? So so it's just a straight up zero. Okay. So I got ahead of myself. So why is it zero? Does that mean we're perfect? Our errors are awesome. Like we have no error. We can put it out on top of the bottom. Right, so the problem is, is that our errors are equally wrong above and below our line, which is kind of a good thing, but doesn't tell us all that much about how good the errors are in general. So they're evenly distributed, but 
that doesn't necessarily mean that, it, that we don't have a ton of error. So, <laughs> yeah, so what we can go on to calculate instead is that RMSE, okay? And so, I was laughing because my cheat sheet, I actually have that round line as the basis. Um, but to do the RMSE, So going back for a second, we take the square of the errors to eliminate cancellation, then we take the mean of the squared errors, and then we take the square root to get it back into the same units. So that's what we're doing here. We're taking the mean of the, or, sorry, we're squaring the errors, and we're taking the mean of that, and then we're bringing it back to the same place. And so our error is about uh, you know, not quite $9,400, uh, $9, okay? So if we're talking about this range of salaries of like, whatever it was, it was like 30K to like 100K, it seems like, you know, 10K, that's not too bad, right? Maybe not quite as good as we would like, but it tells you that our our line will on average be about 10K off for the median income based on college. So, we can actually start to draw that out by using that method that I don't know why I had examples in there, but we can we can talk through it if we like. But basically, this is kind of what we're doing is we're we're calculating each of those red lines and we're kind of averaging them together uh, so that we know how far, generally speaking, we are from that linear prediction. All right, so that's how we get to the error, which will tell us whether or not this is a good way of predicting this particular data element. Um, and so this is kind of just more examples, but if we are, we can use this function, and this is probably not a function I would really test you on, although I think you could be, you'd be perfectly capable of writing it, um, but all it's doing is it's saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna take these kind of samples that, uh, that are are hard coded in to show where the differences are, so that we can then draw a scatter plot, and then we're gonna make um, we're basically gonna plot the red lines on there by moving our line around. We can see how well it does. So instead of actually kind of calculating the line, we can actually just guess, right? And in this case. We're going to give it a slope of 1500 and uh, an intercept of whatever that is, 20,000. And we can kind of see, at least graphically, we can see, hey, this is, uh, you know, how does this one do? And these red lines kind of are the distance away from it. And so this is kind of a way of visualizing the different kinds of errors we have. Um, you know, obviously, this one uses entirely the wrong kind of slope because it's negative right so the slope is going down but so we're just trying to i'm just trying to show that you can actually plot it on the graph and actually see where those errors are and we're going to have some more ways of looking at the errors in a second so yeah um okay so the root mean square error um minimizes among all lines uh and so what we can do is remember i always said like creating that line and then creating the predictions from the lines is really cheap so as a result does anybody have any ideas what we could do to try to do a better job than the way i calculated it so in other words we have this line okay because i went through a lot of work to figure out what that line should be, right? By taking the averages and looking at the, you know, and then calculating the slope and then calculating the intercept. But let's say I had a massive data set and I don't want to try to calculate this. However, I do have this root mean square error technique, right? Which is, oops, which is here, right? Which is relatively cheap. So I have, I know what the, the line looks like and I can get the errors. So what could I do 
if I didn't want to calculate the slope in the intercept. There it is. Try all lines and then calculate the errors and pick one with the smallest amount of error, right? So you could just run them all because this is such a cheap technique that it's actually cheaper sometimes to just test every line than it is to actually figure it out properly. I think it's kind of neat. All right. So this is often referred to as the least square root line or the regressive line or the best fit line, um, where we're actually using the errors to figure out what the line should be rather than figuring out the line and then figuring out how good it is against the errors. That makes sense? Like it seems kind of weird, right? Is that we can actually, it's cheaper in a lot of cases to, to try them all than it is to actually figure it out. Sometimes referred to a group four thing. The technique. So, all right. So, to get the mean square error is what we need here, right? Because we talked about it last time. When we do the NP mean of the Y minus our prediction. Uh, and then square, there it goes. Okay, so I'm kind of just doing it in two pieces so that it's a little uh, easier to follow. But we can show these demographics are going to see. Um, and show what it is. So, in other words, here's us trying lines, right? And we can see this, this result is not a very good one. Um, and then we can try another one. It's also not very good, but we can see the root mean squared error here is 30K. So that's nowhere near as good as we were doing before. And then we did, uh, you know, this one was closer in 11K, uh, but still not as good as our perfect one, right? No question? Um, can you go back to the for demographic errors? This one? No. Uh, the bug at the beginning of this section. Oh, yeah. This one? Yes. You have a question about it? Or? No, it's just. Oh, okay. Right. So, um, you know, mo mostly, is, so I wouldn't worry too much about this one. This is really, it's using kind of more advanced stuff of, of the rendering library that we use so that you can draw the red lines and stuff. You're not going to do that. But it's really just to visualize what we're talking about. But the point is, is that I can, you know, kind of let me just figure out where I was. Um, I can brute force it, right? I can just start trying lines. Um, and, you know, if we put in our actual calculated value, then we get, you know, slightly less than 10K. So that's, that's the right answer because, you know, a lot of times with these examples, We've got that we know what the right answer is, so we can compare it to like our tests. But imagine that we didn't know the slope or the intercept and we wanted to just try stuff. Well, here's a mechanism that we can actually just look at the errors by using a relatively inexpensive mechanism. Um, and then I think. Yeah, okay. Um, ah, uh, like completely soft there. Okay, so yeah, we don't want to actually slide there. So we have our oh, that's why because this code is just repeating, um, but. Well, not quite. So we can do that demographics are on the scene. We don't have to pick, print the scatter and the line and all that stuff. We can actually just get the value, right? Because what we care about is what's the what's the answer, right? And so in this case, we got 11,000 by using a slope of 1,500 and an intercept of 20,000. And then with a slope of one negative 1,000 and an intercept of 75,000, 
uh, we end up with a, a, an error rate of 30K. So that's not good. So conveniently, we have a function called minimize. Okay. And what is that giving us? What do you think? It's right there in the name. So it's super handy. Yeah. Of right. So so it's the slope and the intercept of the smallest one or the smallest error. Okay. Except minimize is a little bit more generic than that. So it's going to take whatever method you you give it, right? And it's going to basically try everything um, and try to get you the smallest error. Okay. And so. Well, with the smallest error, it's going to give you back the like the inputs for the smallest error. So immediately, if you look at the original values, so when we calculated the slope and the intercept, we got this. When we use minimize to just say finding the slope and the intercept with the smallest error, we got the same thing. Okay. But what can be, I think, a little bit confusing about minimize is that it doesn't give you like the answer. It gives you one of the inputs to the method that you call it with, right? So it's saying when you, if you call demographics or MSE with 1270 and 2802, you'll get the smallest error out. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is a, a little bit of an unusual method like that. And so we can obviously calculate it, but sometimes we want something that's cheaper than doing the work. So, all right, does anybody know in kind of mathematics what we might mean by the term residual? You ever heard this before? It's like a toss up whether you have it. So, this is kind of a more formal word for do you remember remainders? Like, we were doing like early, early division and learning about remainders. So, residuals and remainders are, are kind of an all, uh, uh, you know, synonymous. Um, the residual is, um, it, it really means like leftover or residual as the real English word means. Um, and so we talk about it in terms of like kind of what's left. In other words, what's our error, right? So, just going to draw us a nice picture. Oh, no, it's just going to the function to draw this picture. Um, okay, so. Now, what we want to look at next, actually, let's talk about, yeah, so what we want to do is kind of look at what's left, okay? So in other words, okay, now we have our prediction mechanism. What if we want to look at the data that is the leftover? So in other words, we do our prediction. How does it, how does our prediction compare to the actual data? And then can we grab all of those examples and you look at the result of just the differences, right? Okay? And the reason why will be in a minute. Um, so again, we're just essentially going to do subtraction, okay? So we're going to take T uh, column, oops, Y, and subtract predictions, okay? Because that's using that same fitted values. Now we have a method that we can call to get the residuals or the leftovers from uh, running one of these demographics. So our residual is kind of our, our leftover on our test. Um, and so, I don't know, let's, let's look at that next bit. Um, and so this is what we can start to see, okay? So uh, keep in mind, this is, almost like two data sets being put in the same scatter plot. So it can be a little bit confusing, but the blue bits, right, are our real data and our fitted values. And then the green bits down here, this is our residual. So it's kind of like the leftover is whenever we do our predictions. Okay. And the reason we care about that, we're going to get to in a second. Um, yes, got it. is if we look at them separately okay so now i did it's exactly the same graph 
except I have now separated the two scatter plots. So the first one is that our fitted values, et cetera, and then our subtraction, which is our residuals, now is on its own graph rather than kind of shoved into the bottom of the printer. Um, does anybody notice anything interesting about this? Especially when we talk about the correlation coefficient. It seems to have like a opposite sign correlation coefficient. So that close. It's it's worse or it's it's more than that. It's actually it should be getting close to zero. Because what we want is we want those residuals, right? We want that scatter to be as small as possible. So in other words, there shouldn't be any correlation in there. So the closer we can get to the the opposite of what we want for a correlation coefficient. So the closer we can get to basically it's just a blob means that our distribution of error is now kind of perfectly uniform, right? Because what we're doing is we're plotting just the error differences. So now we can see, hey, okay, yeah, we have a certain amount of error, whatever it was about 10K, but we know it's always within 10K if we have a perfect circle, right? Because, and that's really valuable because we know that if we have something that's like spread out or whatever, then that tells us that, okay, it's 10K, but it's, we don't really know, like, is it actually more than 10K because you're on the outside edge, right? But basically it tells us more about the fact that, hey, our distribution of our errors is pretty even as well, okay? Which is super easy. All right, and then this is just the same thing with our mid-parent children um, and then the residuals. So what we use these residuals for is to kind of like, like we have the, the error checking and then this is kind of checking our error checking, right? So that we can kind of say, okay, this is, we, we have a good kind of error rather than a bad kind of error. Does that make sense? Because we want, we want an error that's kind of evenly distributed error, right? Because if we have skewed error, then it's, that, that's still not great. Right, because now we don't know that we like where the error lies. So it's almost like the prediction, right? We want to make a prediction and we want to be able to predict the kind of error we're going to have. So if the error is uniformly distributed, then we know that the error is like that. We know that, yeah, we might be wrong, but it's uniformly wrong anywhere that we make prediction. So we can do things like say, plus or minus 10K and always be right, right? Which is not the same as where somewhere on our prediction line is plus or minus 30K and another place on our prediction line is plus or minus $5. That's not as good, a, it's not as a useful a tool as when we can say plus or minus 10K, right? Does that make sense? It's kind of like layers of indirection that really tell us, it tells us more about the solution and the problem that we're looking at than just any one of those pieces of work. Okay, so um, yeah, so the residual corresponds to each point. We have a residual in three ways. So the observed, there's different ways we can calculate it. So we can observe y minus the regression estimate of y. So the observed y minus the height of the regression line at x, which is kind of the same, that's the same thing, two different ways of saying it or the vertical distance between the point and the best line, kind of a third way, really the, sorry, it's really three of this, three ways of saying the same thing, okay? Or different ways we can kind of think about how we calculate the residual, but these are, this tells us what the residual is for any given point. All right. And I don't think we have time for dugongs today. We will talk about them next time. They may know what a dugong is. I believe, I might be wrong, but I believe they're freshwater manatee, but they're only found in like the uh, Mediterranean or Black Sea. Um, but uh, I, I'm not a fish and wildlife person. So, um, all right, so just uh, remember, uh, we'll post something about uh, uh, Project 2 if there's a, an issue. Hopefully, it's an easy fix. Um, but it's supposed to be due on Friday. Uh,
Okay. Oh, yeah. Stop. 